hospital unit in tin hats and silk stockings. The place that the Germans particularly enjoyed attacking us was when we went down the zigzag from the desert into Tobruk. It was quite a steep hill and they simply loved machine gunning there. They did have a habit of coming along behind one and buzzing us, and that was frightening. Orders used to come from headquarters. Those, when seeing a Stuka, should alight from their vehicles, lie on the ground and roll away as far as possible to avoid carbonization. And I could never decide whether I wanted to shelter my head or my bottom. Generally, my bottom. I always wanted to see what was going on. There may be trouble ahead. There may be trouble ahead. But while there's moonlight and music and love and romance. While there's love and romance. Let's face the music and dance. In their worst nightmare. The Debs of 1937 could hardly have imagined themselves at war in the desert. The only convoys they cared about then were those taking them to Buckingham Palace to be presented to the King and Queen. The idea of all that sand and the people would have made a well-connected young person shudder as she tucked into the quails in aspic. London season is getting underway. So here's the exclusive picture of the exclusive debutants ball at Grosvenor House. Some people didn't enjoy the season. I personally did. I wouldn't like it to have gone on forever. But anyway, there was no choice. Of course, it couldn't. Well, it was, it was over. It's lovely. Thank you very much. We'd had great fun, but everybody was getting geared up. We all Everybody felt the war was coming. It was coming and we had to do something. The Debs of 37, who joined the Elite Mechanized Transport Corps, or MTC, enjoyed a return trip to Buckingham Palace, not to curtsy, but to salute. They also went through intensive training in aspects of the motor car they hadn't known existed. That's really how it started, and whatever it was, it sounded rather adventuresome a great deal better than driving around in the blackout. Driving for the Hadfield Spears Mobile Hospital Unit turned out to be the greatest adventure any of them would ever know. They went first in February 1940 to Saint-Jean-de-Basselle, near the German border, on attachment to the French army. One of the first of the Franco-British medical and surgical units to reach the Western Front is reviewed by a French general. He is accompanied by Lady Hatfield and Mrs. Spears, who have given their names to this unit, which is completely staffed by British women. The inspiration behind the Hatfield Spears unit came from two Americans. Lady Hatfield, wife of a Sheffield steel magnet, who was the money bags, and May Spears, wife of a British officer, who was the dynamo. In 1914, she had established a similar ambulance unit in France. As one of the three richest heiresses in America, she could then well afford to finance it herself. She later lost all her money in the Wall Street crash and turned to novel writing under her maiden name, Mary Borden. Despite some success, she could never have put her First World War experiences to use again in 1939 without help from Lady Hadfield. In assembling the unit, she chose as drivers English girls whose families she knew and nurses who'd looked after her friends. We would have very little salary and we would have to wear our own uniform, but she would provide the cloaks and caps, which she did. And they were made at lily white, so they were very super. And she hoped that we would all enjoy what we did, although she wouldn't promise it would be an easy passage. After the fall of France in June 1940, the members of the Hadfield Spears unit were lost without trace for two weeks. When they finally got back to Britain, their hair-raising flight across France was headline news. With the way to Dunkirk cut off by the Germans, they had made for the far southwest and got out on the last civilian ship to leave. 
General de Gaulle, having left France at the same time, was now at the head of 8,000 free French troops in England, here being inspected by the king. De Gaulle had been helped out of France by General Spears, whose wife May then suggested that the Hadfield Spears unit should go into action with the free French. His Majesty also met Miss Mary Borden, the novelist wife of General Spears. She presented nurses and women of the MTC now attached to General de Gaulle's army. All of them had formerly done heroic work with the 4th French Army in France. Having won their spurs in the phony war, the Hadfield Spears unit, under their indomitable leader, now became part of a combined operation in the front line. Even May Spears had qualms about sending 15 young women to North Africa. But in the next three years, they were to cover thousands of miles across the desert, providing hospital services from Syria in the east to Tunisia in the west. The Hadfield Spears unit was a striking example of the way war can give common purpose to the most motley collection of allies. The doctors were French, the bearers were from French West Africa, and the General Dog's bodies were a group of Quakers and conscientious objectors from Britain, doing their bit as members of the Friends Ambulance Unit. But it was the girl drivers, straight out of the top drawer, who gave the unit its distinctive flavour and caused a stir wherever they went. Oh, they couldn't believe it when we first went up. And we heard from one lorry driver, who we overtook on our first journey up. They said, by God, it's women. We thought it was a mirage. We had one slightly irritating nurse who seemed somehow often to be in the back of my staff car. And I do remember on our way up to Tobruk, her great sport, because she was bored in the back seat, was to hang her head out of the window, surprise the oncoming driver by saying, funny seeing women here, isn't it? Whereupon most of the drivers swerved quite badly. And on we went. The girl drivers were each assigned a staff car for ferrying senior personnel and collecting supplies. The cars were all Ford V8s, except for one old banger living on borrowed time. We all had our own car, and Kit had this dreadful old thing, which was a Chevrolet, which the French christened La Belle Marguerite, <laughs> which was yeah, an absolute yeah, sod was... to dry. It had no springs, so she used to have to put bags of sand in it, do you remember, <laughs> to keep it on the road at all. And it really was a, a really awful car to drive. The steering was never right, was it? The no, brakes no. didn't exist. No. You did. adored her, though. You I didn't adore her. I oh. hated her, really. But, oh. I mean, she was better than my feet. After all, there was no <laughs> choice. <laughs> I had to make her go. <laughs> for Kit and Rachel, war meant transferring a lifelong passion for horses onto their cars. Yeah, she's so fat. She's fat. There's little doubt which they preferred. But Kit Tatham Water, soon to become T.W., switched effortlessly from point-to-pointing to motor mechanics. I think she developed an affection not quite as much as for horses, but it became a sort of personal affection for each car and its individuality. Well, they did all have personalities, didn't yes. they? And some went some. when you kicked them and others went when you... And she was a remarkable mechanic, born to it. Yeah, I think she could get anything going, even without almost the spare parts. They'd improvise, that was the thing. You they and could. I were not definitely mechanics. I'm afraid not, no. <laughs> <laughs> But you had to see as your car went, because otherwise you'd have been left behind and marooned. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Well, you'd be picked up eventually, but still. You'd be in terrible trouble with T.W. And Kit was a hard taskmaster. She was very bossy. <laughs> she made me change six desert tires once in one morning. And I don't know whether you know what a desert tire is, but it's twice the size of an ordinary tire. And it's absolute Brilliant. hell to get off and on. When they were driving on their own, running repairs could be a matter of life and death. If you broke down in the desert, the first rule was to stay in your car and de merde vous, as the French used to say, which meant we went through our carburetors and petrol pumps, which are generally full of sand, and very often that was all we needed to do. Half shafts were the other things our old Fords were always breaking, mm. weren't they? Yeah. And we always carried a spare one. 
the MTC had something of a reputation of being fast drivers. I, I seem to remember that when we were in Beirut, uh, they used to be able to drive over to Damascus in two hours, which was only 60 miles, but it was 60 such extremely difficult miles that, um, you know, I don't think we could ever hope to do it in our trucks under about twice that no. time. I was driving a chap up to our oak post in Bir Hakim across the desert. And as I'd been asked to have lunch with Koenig, who was in command then, I put on my best uniform, including stockings, which were never worn normally. And we were about three quarters of the way there, well and truly into the desert, when one of my uh, uh, water pipes burst. And so there I was with two gallons of water in a spare can and a very much leaking hose pipe. So as I had my stockings on, I took them off and I bandaged up the hose pipe with my stockings and fixed it with insulating tape and arrived at Bir Hakim all in good order. And everybody said how marvelous Madame Roussel was. <laughs> And the result was I had more pairs of stockings brought me from the Delta when people were not leave than you could ever imagine. Les, les conductrices euh, ont contribué à la personnalité de l'ambulance, oui, parce qu'elles étaient le trait d'union entre l'ambulance et les autres unités. C'était en quelque sorte les ambassadrices de l'ambulance. Elles étaient connues des centaines de kilomètres à la ronde. Negotiating minefields was part of the routine of desert driving, and often cool nerves were needed to get out alive. You and I yeah. drove in yeah. for mine. Yeah. I drove that's what I mean. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. I we made did. You. It was my fault. Yes, I knew we had what we had once, yeah. but we came out on our tracks. Yes, anyway. I walked behind you. Yeah. In front. No, because no, you behind. had to back up. That's right behind. Yes. <laughs> I mean, one was always a bit afraid. You couldn't help but be a bit afraid, but you didn't take any notice of it. Of course, I mean, you hadn't time to be frightened, to start with, and you couldn't do anything about it. Un jour, j'étais seul dans la voiture de Miss Ford, et euh, à un moment donné, on a été attaqué par des avions euh, en, italiens, et euh, bien la solution, c'était de tourner en rond pour éviter que de recevoir leur, euh, leur balle. Et ça en était parfaitement bien tiré, avec beaucoup de sang-froid. She lives in a dugout or gitoon with a tarpaulin for a roof. Just as uncomfortable as the frontline troops, right in among them, in fact. I remember we had gitoons, which were frequently blown away and sometimes flooded. But however, they were done again. Tough as these girls have grown to be, they cling to their glamour. On a makeshift dressing table in their tent, amongst the foundation cream, lipstick and rouge, is a spare carburetor. Whenever we struck camp and were there for any length of time. I used to try and scrounge some orange boxes, put my rug over it, and my mirror up. And I used to get teased for this, but it was a sort of small corner like home, and quite a lot of people were very grateful for the use of the mirror. They eat the same rations as the men, drink the same salty water. We had two gallons of water a week ration, and they took some of that away for our coffee and tea. And um, everyone had a different way of using their water, whether you washed your hair first, or your teeth first, or your body first, or your clothes <laughs> first. And in the end, we got it down to a fine art. We used to wash our hair in paraffin, our clothes in petrol, and then keep our, our water for our underclothes and, and the rest, our teeth and our bodies. <laughs> There were all sorts of times when we had to move in a hurry or do something, and les femmes 
just throw a fit. They said, you can't do it in this time. It's impossible. We were just about to do this or that. We didn't usually catch them washing their hair, but it was this sort of thing. In retrospect, it was enormous fun, because everybody just said, oh, le fun, and got on with it, and le fun, and got on with it too. As though fighting a war wasn't enough, there was the natural hazard of the region to contend with. The desert storm the Arabs call Hamsi. And the whole desert, the whole army, as they came really to a standstill. Even the Germans came to a standstill. I was driving May Spears, and suddenly a ham scene arose, a really very bad one. The visibility became nil. So May said, we'd better stop. So we stopped. And after a few minutes, I heard a vehicle drawing up near us. And I thought, well, at least this is some comfort. So I got out. And I struggled towards in this howling wind, the vehicle which I could just see, and I hammered hard, nobody seemed to be, I hammered hard on the windows. And then I heard a voice say, Do I hear the sound of angels' voices? And it was a sergeant who couldn't believe that a woman could possibly be there. It was very difficult to nurse in a sandstorm in the desert. And we crawled to the tents on our hands and knees because we couldn't see. And we wore goggles with thick linings around the edge. And it can be quite painful when it drives against your face. It's like a lot of grit. Scorching, yeah. Yeah, scorching. And it wrecked our engines, they put in our teeth. Everything. And everything. I mean, everything. Food, everything. Oh. And there were days when we couldn't possibly undo a dressing. But some had to be done and injections had to be given. And it was a very, very precarious business. And not at all enjoyable for the patient or for ourselves. In battle, a forward unit of the Hadfield Spears Hospital sometimes used a tented lorry as an operating theatre. Many lives were saved because casualties could be brought for surgery within minutes of being wounded. The anaesthetist was Dr. Louise Marie Askin, the first woman to be employed in the French army. And it's De Gaulle who has himself taken the decision, saying, you have to be wrong, we are very few, we have need of all the good volunteers. When a woman can hold a role effectively, you have to engage her. The French medical team earned the respect of the British contingent for skill and dedication in circumstances which could hardly have been less promising. And in the case of the eccentric chief surgeon, Jean-Frédéric Vernier, always known as Le Colonel, respect was mingled with affection. He had a wonderful sense of humour. I think he largely led by his, his friendliness and, and his capacity to have jokes, to overlook some of the absurdities. In fact, he created a great many of the absurdities himself. And he kept on practicing doing operations with as few instruments as possible. Drove some of his staff crazy, but he could do complicated operations with just one knife and one scalpel. Bernier was determined to show uh, that no German patient, uh, or so whenever we had to deal with them, uh, would ever forget that he'd been operated on in a free French hospital. So no matter uh, how small the operation, the scar was always in the form of a Croix de Lorraine. He was an eccentric individual, was Vernier. He drove his uh, jeeps like a madman. You know, the French were pretty good at driving into it. <laughs> yeah. Our colonel wrote off about eight cars during the war. <laughs> yes. uh, unbelievable. Job demarcation in the Hadfield Spears unit left the Quakers and conscientious objectors with all the dirty work. It was they who put up the tents, cleaned out the latrines, and did the laundry. There was a lot of washing that went on because all the beds had sheets and blankets, which was, you know, quite exceptional in the desert. Mm, very exceptional. In contrast with their menial duties, the pacifists were the crack troops of the unit intellectually. For a historian, even running the laundry was a stimulus to study. Of course, it was very useful having to look for water because uh, wherever there was water, there was likely to have been a Roman before me looking for water. So I could combine things uh, very easily. And uh, in the end, I found that without cheating too much, I could say, where's the nearest Roman ruins? I'd like to find my water there. As well as academics, the Friends Ambulance Unit contained many artists with pacifist convictions. 
This sculpture, created 40 years after the war, is one pacifist's view of the military. This little figure I call Sentinel. He arrived like much of my work by just simply playing about with bits of wood. This is an offcut from another wood carving. This makes his beret. His head is just a little burr cut off a tree. Although it's quite a recent sculpture, it evokes for me the sort of rigid attention of a sentinel waiting to challenge you as you approach a camp. His rifle is particularly apt. Insofar, these were fragments of an old French chair and I put them together to make up that rather decorative little rifle that is suitable for this very rough, ready, alert character that I wanted to portray. I like it, I think it comes off. <laughs> The girl drivers, with friends and relations in the front line, had mixed feelings about the friend's ambulance unit. I admired the real Quakers. Mm. We didn't think so much of the conscientious objectors. Not you when see. we were in the position that the country was in when the war started. The Quakers were absolutely marvellous because they were convinced people. They really believed in peace and helping and so on. And they didn't mind what they put up with. They did the most horrible jobs without grumbling. A lot of the work that was really needed was people who would unblock lavatories and this sort of thing, <laughs> uh, who would do a lot of the dirty work about the place. And this made the difference in the long run. I think basically why we're rather popular that we would turn our hands to all that kind of thing. The readiness of the intelligentsia to take up lavatory cleaning reinforced the French view of the English as slightly touched. A suspicion the girl drivers did nothing to dispel. Jacine Rassol, elle adorait la botanique et elle n'avait pas évidemment pensé qu'elle aurait beaucoup d'occasion de d'en faire dans le désert. Mais il s'est trouvé qu'à au moment du printemps, il y a eu une courte période de pluie de deux trois jours. Tous les gens habitués au désert le connaissent et ça a fait surgir une végétation. Des, de l'herbe, des fleurs absolument extraordinaires d'une beauté que personne n'aurait soupçonné et parfumée, vraiment merveilleuse. Alors, Jocelyne était folle, absolument folle. Elle ne savait plus où se tourner, elle regardait partout, celle-ci, celle-là, elle est décidée tout. <coughs> When I was off duty, I used to wander off into the wadis and collect what I could find handy. I would then bring them back and shove them in my drinking mug, and wait until I was on call when I'd sit at the door of the tent and do my drawings, ready to go off anywhere at any time. The Germans were very punctual, you know. They used to come over and do their bombing in the morning so that they come, could come out of the sun. And then they came over later on in the afternoon so that they'd come out of the sun from the opposite direction. So one really had to take one's tin hat every time you went off duty. And so I was wandering about the wadis with my tin hat on and picking the flowers as I found them. And I had my little black vasculum with me, you see, so I picked a flower. I put it in the basket and I picked another flower and I put it in the basket. And then I jumped down into a wadi, practically on top of some war correspondence. They said, oh, thank God, it's a woman. We couldn't think what the Eighth Army was coming to, picking flowers. Mary Borden, the popular novelist, was now equally well known as Lady Spears, wife of General Sir Louis Spears. She divided her time between her husband's posting in Syria and flying visits to the unit. The histrionic white headdress, which advertised her star billing, was kept like her husband's plumes of office in a tin hat box she took everywhere. Lady Spears was always known as the G because um, well, her husband was a general by the time we were there, but she was the general's wife very much. 
she was American, and she was more upper class English than the most upper class English woman, I think. <laughs> she, um, she was always acting the great lady. And what was the time you drove her to Walking Lex headquarters, and they put her in a room where, where the latest battle, mm -hmm. yes, mm -hmm. battle organization was, and she said, what's this? And they were absolutely horrified because it was, the, you know, the next attack. <laughs> She was uh, arrogant, uh, but uh, again had no sympathy with our views, though I think became quite fond of us, in, or some of us as individuals. Some of us used to have to be drafted in to play bridge with her of an evening when she couldn't make up a four from anybody else. Basically, I think, much more interested in her women in the unit. As I remember Lady Spears, I think one of the things that she felt very strongly was that she wanted really to prove, as it were, that women were perfectly capable of doing all sorts of jobs in war. And in those days, there's no doubt, there was quite a lot of prejudice. It is certain that, from a certain point of view, the conductrices were not irremplaceable. And uh, often, on posait la question de savoir que font-elles ces filles euh, au milieu du désert, parmi les combattants. We were much less important than the nurses, and probably mm. the Quakers too, except that we did work in the hospital when they were wounded, very hard, and I found myself almost as much in the hospital as driving. Actually, oh, I was in the hospital yeah. much more. Well, we only kept one driver on when there was a battle or anything like that. Yes. Generally, I found myself in the resuscitation ward, doing eight hours on, eight hours off, giving nothing else but blood transfusions and plasma. According to the French, the fact that the women were there to help nurse them and do everything made a tremendous effect on morale. It was a, a calming effect, you see. They sort of felt well if girls were there, it can't be too bad. I'm sure Lady Spears must have felt after the war that she had proved her point. And uh, to that extent, uh, it was a, what Winnie the Pooh would call a good thing, I think. <laughs> Despite turning their hands to almost anything in a crisis, the girls were there principally as drivers. The qualifications for the job were mechanical resourcefulness with a dash of passenger psychology. The convoys which the unit often joined formed a nomadic retinue behind the battle lines. At night, the girl drivers learned to see their vehicles were fed and watered first, just like their horses. Ways of relieving the boredom varied according to intellect. I've been a historian at Oxford, so I used to enjoy reading a good deal, and there was a ten-minute gap each uh, pause in the convoys uh, each hour and so I would read and then get asked the person behind to hoot when the convoy was moving on and I got through quite a few volumes of um, Toynbee's uh, study of history and used rather pretentiously at the end to put where we were when uh, that volume was finished. The first heavily mined roads were encountered at Halfire Pass where the twisting road rises 700 feet. We were driving up from Libya into Tunisia, and we had to go along the edge of the Gulf of Serti, which was very th well and thoroughly mined. So you couldn't get off the road at all. And once the convoy was held up, 
And there, just inside the minefield, was the most gorgeous wild dolphin you've ever seen. And the amount of discipline that it took to keep me in my seat has to be measured in absolutely millions. Even on a 15-day convoy, the longest lasting of the war, there were echoes of English country life. Do you remember uh, Barbara's pigeons? Yes, there was a pair of those. No. And they were sitting on eggs all the way up the, up the convoy we did. Yes, we took, put them in the boot of the car in a, in a cardboard box. And Barbara let them out every uh, evening. Yes. And they hatched yes. two. They yes. hatched two little, little pigeons. Yes, they did, yeah. Do you remember when Biddy and I woke up and found a rabbit sitting in our tent? Yes. And we thought we had DTs. Yes, that's true. And, and um, your dog, Olga, that died of rabies. Yes, I had a lovely boxer. And the Arabs had used to turn up with ponies for us to ride all over the place. Yes, yes. They were great fun. The real desert, you know, proper Arabs. Arabs. <laughs> The British High Command in Tobruk had little time for women, but they'd reckoned without May Spears. We arrived outside of Tobruk, and Mrs. Spears went into a building where the English officers were having a meeting, and she just announced, I have arrived with my gals. And they said, well, you can't stay here. If there's nothing standing in Tobruk, and there are no women up here, and you will have to go back. And she flatly refused. She said, we're staying here, the French have told us to come up, and we're with an Anglo-French unit, and therefore we stay. The fortunes of the Hatfield Spears unit were followed with intense interest at home. When they first got to Tobruk, they were the only women in the entire combat zone. Though the stand made by May Spears encouraged the British to move their nurses up as well. You are very fond of you. And I forget Here, along a desert shore, the potency of cheap music the was irresistible. The ordinary thing that in a kind of daydream, I'm happy as a king. It's very difficult to remember, after 40-odd years, what we were doing. One thing I do remember was the enjoyment we had out of the music from my old grandfather. We used to sit by the beach and enjoy it in our off-duty and take it down to the wards in the Tobruk Hospital where the soldiers used to love it. All the uh, variety of records that we had. And all those years ago, the thing played rather better oh, it than played it does much today. Better, yes, yes, it doesn't play very well now. We never had to wind it up in the middle of a record. Just the thought of you, the very thought of you, my love. Just is not a convenient place to have romances. Sand dunes are not really conducive to romance. Uh, I think, on the whole, there were very few. But to not to be seen, you'd have had to move a long way from the camp, taking one of the cars, not also especially convenient. So it was not really the desert a place of great romance, contrary to sometimes what is shown in films. How slow the moment goes I think on, on the whole, we often had friends, old friends or friends we'd met on the way out around the Cape who came to see us and would sit on the beach and talk to us, and that was great fun. And perhaps we made assignations with them to meet in Alexandria or in Cairo. <laughs> And obviously, being the driver, and we used to take the opportunity to either go to the Gazira Club or to look up a relation or a friend and take advantage of the fact that the car had been sent into Cairo. Or, and I think in that way, we had an advantage over the nurses. 
Human nature being what it is, putting ex-debutants in close proximity with conscientious objectors and professional nurses caused occasional tensions. Well, the nannies were very jealous of us because we were mobile and they weren't. So if they wanted to go anywhere, they had to ask us to take them. And they also were very annoyed because we called them nannies. And they didn't like that at all. We put our feet down about that because we were all trained hospital nurses. We'd been sisters or staff nurses in London. And we didn't consider that we were nannies as they had probably had in their childhood. Well, we didn't see much of the drivers, really. I think um, they were always rather aloof and thought themselves rather upper class, I think. I think they were probably quite pleasant, but they didn't mix with us very much. And I imagine, although they were fairly polite about it, they felt conscious were rather a strange thing. We saw much more of the nurses, whom uh, uh, on the whole we got on well with, and some married. When I first met Jim, in Beirut, and he was a patient of mine. And then later on, on night duty, he was one of my orderlies. And in the morning, when we'd finished, I remember making Jim and other people bacon and eggs on a primus stove, and I think that's really how we started <laughs> to get to know each other, because I gave them a nice breakfast. They worked much more closely together, really, because we were either un in our cars or under our cars or worrying about our cars, whereas they were in the hospital and working together. Cynthia became the first driver to get married during the war to a British officer in Cairo. Rachel met her future husband, a free French officer, in unromantic circumstances in Tobruk. I was repairing my car or doing something to it, and Rennie came up because his truck had broken down and asked me something, and I, re I didn't reply because I was much too busy, and he pulled me out from under the car, and I was absolutely furious. <laughs> <laughs> and he was amazed to see a girl under the car. Already married when she joined the unit, Jocelyn heard grievous news in Tobruk. Her husband was reported missing. I'd been writing to him, of course, regularly. And after about three months, all my letters were sent back to me. And that was a very nasty blow. But it was one of those things that one can always keep on hoping. Because I knew that he was on a secret mission. I now know that he was doing an SOE mission in Sumatra. And you know what the Japanese prisoner taking was like. You couldn't hope to get any direct news. And so there was always hope it might be hidden away somewhere. But her hopes came to nothing. Well, the Americans arrived at the end of the desert war when we were in Tunisia. And Kit and I were sitting in our tent having a little drink of whiskey when the Americans arrived in a jeep and said they'd heard there were women around <laughs> and they wanted to get acquainted. And Kit and I had no wish to get acquainted with the Americans and they wouldn't go Not away. That type of so we shot at their <laughs> jeep and they went away very quickly indeed. We didn't like them. I mean, it was no, as simple as that. that. There was a story going round that Eisenhower had been asked what his men were like, and he said, well, they're just like a bunch of bananas. Some are, some are green, some are yellow, and some are just plum rotten. Well, we kept well clear of them, really. I said, no manners, no nothing. Only one idea in that tiny head. Once the Americans took over, we had to take what they gave us. We didn't like it very much. For instance, we'd much rather have bully beef than spam. The old hands soon felt that American red tape was cramping their style. Well, it was after the free and the easy Eighth Army, when we've only got to ask for something, and they do their best to give it to us. If you wanted anything from the Americans, you had to sign in triplicate, which didn't suit us at all. So we helped ourselves if we could. We were always short of spares for our Ford V8s, which, after all, had done a pretty big mileage in bad condition. 
And after the German withdrawal from Cap Bon, there was an awful lot of captured German material. And we spotted in one of the corrals where they put the captured material a perfectly good German Ford. So we thought, well, that would suit us nicely. So we applied for it. The Americans said, no, we couldn't have it. Well, we thought that was absolute rubbish. So two of us went off with a tow rope and we waited until lunchtime when the only three guards went off to have their lunch. And we just slipped into the compound and we coupled up the Ford. One of us drove it and the other drove our car and we took it away. And before you could say knife, it was covered with our camouflage and being picked to bits and put into our cars. <laughs> In 1943, the victorious Allies began to withdraw from North Africa. The Hatfield Spears unit made its way, with difficulty, to Naples. Liberty ships weren't allowed to take women on board, so the Colonel had an idea of dressing us up as men. It was our rule that we were never parted with our cars, and that's why we wanted to get on the ships. And we were taken down to the quayside and hidden. And all was well until some silly nurse got on board, unknown to us, and went walking round the deck with her hair flowing, and of course that was the end of us. We found our way over in the end by different means. Don't send me in. Four of the girl drivers were so keen to get to Naples before their cars that they used any form of transport they could wangle. Jocelyn and I got a lift down to Tunis and managed to persuade a little RAF officer to send us over to Italy as um, priority number two, which was very high up in the list. Um, Biddy and Iris got across as freight, and we all met up in Naples at about the same time. And the colonel was delighted to see us because we got there before him, and we helped unload our cars and everything, and that was fine until we discovered that we had got over illegally. We got 15 days CB. <laughs> Being confined to barracks hardly mattered at the height of the Italian campaign. The offenders spent every waking minute working flat out at the field hospital. Our division was in action then, and they were going so fast up Italy and we couldn't keep up with them. We were moving every three days, and so in the end, they put us in front of the guns, of our guns, so that we were shelled not only by our guns with the odd one that fell short, <laughs> but also by the enemy guns. A lot of our planes were above us. Inside 60 seconds, the area of the target was covered by a terrifying great wide wall of dense smoke. During the Battle of Monte Cassino, we were very near to the fighting and we had to take down our red crosses and with binoculars we could see across and see the Germans who were shelling us or shelling all around us and we wore our tin hats. We went further on then and talked with French troops. They're fighting like lions. Nurses also right under fire in mobile hospitals and magnificent frontline surgical units. These women are wonderful and we had so many patients brought in that the doctors had to go up and down the line of bodies to see the ones he could uh, rescue and the ones that there was nothing he could do for. And we were very, very hectically busy. They had a, a shell straight through the operating tent, so the colonel removed the body he was operating on onto the ground. And he said, be careful, don't tread on his intestines, because they were all laid out on the grass. And the man's intestines were put back again covered in grass, and he survived. As the Allies moved north through Italy during 1944, news came of the Normandy landings, and top-secret plans were made for French commandos to spearhead the invasion of France from the south. A unit of Hatfield Spears personnel was to go with them. Well, it was my luck to be chosen to drive the colonel to a secret rendezvous with the commandos, and when he went off to do an exercise, I was left with an over-amorous um, officer, messing officer, and I managed to wheedle out of him exactly what was going on. And when the colonel returned on our way home, I confronted him with the story and asked if I could go too. And he agreed on condition that one of the nurses went as well. 
And when he told the general and the commando officers, they were absolutely horrified and said on no condition would they take women with them. There was an 80% chance of us either being injured, killed, or taken prisoner. But we've argued that with the general, and he finally gave way and said that he would never understand English women. Two British women landed on the Riviera with French commanders. Both girls have been serving with the Hadfield Spears ambulance. Rachel is a pretty, blue-eyed, slightly built girl, while Joan is a husky lass who looks as if she can swim a dozen miles without turning her hair. Colonel Vernier led the medical team, which included Quakers as well as the two girls, and the unit's pharmacist, Pierre Mergier. They hadn't seen France for four years. Nous nous sommes approchés de la côte, sans bruit, dans les petits LCT. À un moment, nous avons senti les, les odeurs, d'abord, de la terre qui arrivait. Et ça nous a parlé plus que n'importe quoi. On a vu se dessiner la plage, et puis il y a eu un petit choc, et nous nous sommes retrouvés euh, pratiquement au bord de l'eau. Notre premier réflexe à tous, ça a été d'aller toucher, d'aller toucher matériellement le sable. On a embrassé la terre, et euh, nous sommes ensuite euh, enfoncés à l'intérieur avec le sentiment d'être de retour chez nous, donc invulnérable. Well, we were landed on the wrong beach at the Canadale, and we were very lucky. It was a blessing in disguise, because the beach we should have been landed on was very heavily mined. And the Germans thought that the Canadale was so small that no landing could possibly take place, and they kept it as their own private bathing bay. Here is a special communique just issued from... The rest of the unit came in with the Allied troops. Today, American, British and French troops, strongly supported by Allied air forces, are being landed by American, British and French fleets on the southern coast of France. Landing off a landing craft, the south of France, was really one of the top things of my war, because we dreamed about it for so long. And we liberated the Riviera. I remember when we got to the south of France, seeing young people, especially young men, who perhaps during the war had been hidden away because their parents were frightened they'd get into trouble with the Germans, and it had nothing to do, and they used to watch us looking after our cars, and greasing them or washing them. One felt they were desperately wanting to do something, and they were watching us doing things that they felt they should be doing, which was right. Once in France, the Hadfield Spears unit began to change in character. French civilians were eager to join, and the influence of the British contingent declined. As an added setback, their unstoppable founder could spend less time with the unit. May Spears was still in the Middle East with her husband. General Sir Louis Spears, here in civilian dress, had by now fallen out with his former friend, General de Gaulle, whose penchant for offending Englishmen was notorious. And this, too, was to have a bearing on the unit's future. Most of the unit, and all the British girls, came through the war alive, and they joined the victory parade in Paris for what should have been their finest hour. Le grand défilé du 18 juin, qui avait une énorme importance pour tous les gens qui venaient de participer à toutes ces années d'hostilité. Nous avions astiqué les voitures, préparé les jeeps. Le défilé s'est passé d'une manière incomparable, par un temps superbe. Tous les Parisiens étaient sur le parcours. And we drove down it in our staff cars, all feeling very happy. And when we came to pass General de Gaulle, we thought he looked rather glum and not very pleased. And in the crowd at that position, there were a lot of our wounded. And when they saw us coming along, they immediately shrieked out, Leave Spears! Well, unfortunately, the girl heard this and thought that they were cheering General Spears and not us. And so he was absolutely livid and told us to be dismissed at once. 
De Gaulle's motives were analyzed minutely, and the interested parties all had an opinion. C'était pour une histoire de petits drapeaux, hein. De Gaulle a vu rouge quand il a vu les petits drapeaux anglais sur les sur les véhicules parce que tous nos machins, tous nos véhicules avaient euh, d'un côté le petit drapeau français, de l'autre le petit drapeau anglais. On était une unité parfaitement franco-anglaise. May Spears, incensed at the slur on her team, made her feelings known in the clearest possible manner. De Gaulle reposted, and an Anglo-French row of classic proportions ensued. De Gaulle's immaculate straight left alternated furiously with the snappy counterpunching of Lady Spears. Au bout de quelques jours, Le colonel Vernier a pu nous annoncer qu'il avait reçu une lettre personnelle du général de Gaulle. After misspelling the name of the unit, de Gaulle failed to explain why he disbanded it. Though he made some amends by praising its devoted service and thanking the British personnel who had served the French army so unstintingly. Il a fallu cette euh, lettre et cette démonstration d'estime pour atténuer un petit peu l'amertume euh, du coup qui nous avait été porté. En 1939, Lady Hadfield, financière de la Hadfield Spears Unit, a assembled les premières supplies à son home in Carlton House Terrace. It later became the headquarters of the Free French. In 1987, all bitterness put aside, General Simon of the Foreign Legion came here to mark the founding of the Free French Army and lay a wreath to the dead. It was a moment to look back nearly 50 years to the early days of the war, when King and country welcomed de Gaulle and his men to London. And to that strange and fruitful partnership between the Hadfield Spears unit and the Free French Army. For General Simon, the ties are close. He's an old patient. Vous êtes un bon client de mes... J'étais un bon client. <rire> nous avons été admirablement soignés par cet hôpital de campagne. Vous étiez malade avec le dessin de pied. C'est ça, oui, en Et Tunisie. Et j'étais obligée oui. de vous donner les... Des piqûres, des oui. Des piqûres. <rire> oh, c'était atroce, c'était est... atroce. <rire> Rachel, pour la Ra vie. Rachel nous, nous, nous piquait euh, très, très mal. Elle nous faisait un mal fou. <rire> quand on nous piquait, mais comme elle avait de très jolis yeux, on lui pardonnait tout. Voilà, merci. Voilà. Les gens étrangères, c'était ouais. merveilleux. Oui, oui. <rire> on fait toute la guerre ensemble. Oui, oui. Et pratiquement, l'hôpital de Spears a soigné plus de 20 000 blessés oui. pendant la guerre. Oui, C'est une chose, il faut dire, absolument extraordinaire. Oui, oui. Ouais. Et il nous reste les très bons souvenirs. Et... Alors, alors nous allons maintenant avoir le grand honneur de recevoir Sa oui. Majesté oui. la Reine Mère à l'Olympia. Oui. L'Olympia était le dépôt, comme vous savez, des forces françaises oui. libres oui. en juin 1940. Yeah. 